My name is Professor Michael King, and I'm a co-researcher on this project with Professor Basma Majerbi at University of Victoria. In this climate finance project, which has been funded by the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, we're working with the Solution Seeker, BC Investment Management Corporation, to look at incorporating climate risks and opportunities into their investment decision making. This is a three-year project that started in January of 2021 and will run until January 2023. From a scientific point of view, if you look into the work that's been done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of scientists who are actual specialists in this who agree that we are causing a warming of the planet. Um, and if you're not convinced by the science itself, perhaps you're convinced by the weather forecast this weekend, where we're going to have record-shattering heat. Now, of course, uh, climate change means variability of climate, not only warming, but um, we're going to be talking a little bit later about the, the physical risks associated with climate change, and one of them is, is heat waves. Where my project actually finds its origin is actually going back to 2015, the Paris Agreement which is this UN uh, agreement or framework signed by 196 different countries at what was called the Conference of Parties or COP21 in Paris. And this agreement, which is very short, you can download it and read it online, actually included reference to climate finance needed for mitigation, which is to finance to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as adaptation, which means to invest in ways that our, our economies and our society can actually thrive or at least uh, continue in the presence of global warming. Those two goals are enshrined in Article 2 and Article 9 of the Paris Agreement. And this was kind of the, the, the start of a new area of finance known as climate finance. Here in Canada, we actually had our, our government uh, put together an expert panel to look into how can we use finance or mobilize finance and for sustainable growth because um, climate change and climate finance falls under a broader umbrella of called sustainable finance, which may also go under the acronym ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance. Now, sustainable finance or responsible investing is concerned with societal and environmental impacts and climate change is going to be simply one of a number of different categories under environment with biodiversity loss and, and, and species loss and other uh, effects under that same category of environment. But this, uh, this report, which was actually chaired by Tiff Macklem, currently the governor of the Bank of Canada, they did a, a cross Canada consultations and they looked at ways that we could actually adapt our finance sector to try and promote the changes that are going to be required in order to move to a, a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emission economy by 2050. Now, around 2018, BC Investment Management Corporation, which is the, the, the manager for pension funds for over 600,000 active and retired residents of British Columbia, they put out their climate action plan. And this was in response to some, uh, some developments that were going on, including uh, a push to have greater disclosure, which is known as the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. And in that plan, BCI basically said that they have a four steps that they're going to adapt. Managing risks, integrating a climate analysis into their investment decision making, looking at opportunities, and engaging and advocating with, uh, for disclosure as well as uh, steps by companies to change. And if you look into that document, it says that really BCI is trying to quantify the risks associated with climate change and look at how that will affect outcomes. And by outcomes, they mean what are what's going to be the returns across different asset classes, stocks, bonds, real estate, infrastructure. And they're going to do this by looking at climate change paths. Much of what we're going to be talking about is highly uncertain. And so we're going to be relying on scenarios or pathways as opposed to projecting trends from the past. So that's what led to my colleague Baz Majerbi and I proposing this project to PIX. And with PIX, which is uh, based at UVic, but it's actually a consortium of uh, four BC universities, they actually are funding a number of projects. And this was an unusual project because they typically fund science-based projects. And here we are coming from the social sciences and we're looking at 
ways to incorporate uh, climate risks and opportunities into decision making. All projects that are approved by PICS have to be working with a solution seeker. And in this case, BCI agreed to be our solution seeker and because of the work that they're doing. And they saw an opportunity to have us both uh, look at the, what they're doing and provide comments, but also reach out to academics abroad, look into the research that's coming from many different fields. It's quite inter interdisciplinary. And, and see if we could also contribute to their to their their new framework for analyzing the systemic risks associated with uh, with climate change. I've talked about risks a couple times, and what I plan to talk about is two different types of risks: physical risks and transition risks. Physical risks are actual damage to uh, the economy and to the planet that could be caused by global warming or temperature increases as well as the, the type of variability that we're seeing. Extreme weather events, droughts, forest fires, sea level rise causing flooding, uh, heavy precipitation, uh, decline in yields of crops, heat waves, and cyclones. Those are actually going to physically damage both people, uh, the, uh, the natural environment, as well as the physical infrastructure in which we live. The other type of risks that we're going to see are called transition risks, and this is often called adaptation. How are we going to adapt to that change in global temperatures, and how are we going to adapt the economy to try and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and stop global warming at less than two degrees, but preferably one and a half degrees close to uh, industrial times. And that, that refers to uh, government policies, uh, new investments in technologies such as uh, carbon capture from the air, how people are going to change their behaviors, such as uh, driving electric vehicles as opposed to internal combustion engines, changing demands for different fuel sources, etc. So as you can see here, there's a, a wide variety of ways that the economy may be affected, and those will, of course, flow through to financial markets and to financial securities, which are the investments that are held by pension funds. It's not just uh, the IMF. Uh, that's concerned with this, or not just uh, climate scientists. It's also central banks. And this organization here, the Network for Greening the Financial System, is a voluntary organization that was set up by initially a group of eight central banks and supervisors in 2017. And it grew by the time of this report in 2019 to 34 members and five observers. And as of now, it's actually at 91 central banks and supervisors, as well as 14 observers. What is the NGFS doing? They are working on, together on a voluntary basis to share knowledge, to try and understand how this is climate change is going to affect our economies. They're trying to promote sustainable finance and working with many different organizations, uh, such as IOSCO or UN organizations, to, uh, to understand what needs to be done from the climate finance point of view. So, this is the kind of charts they've put out looking at how physical risks due to global warming and climate change could affect both equities, bonds, uh, real estate, uh, insurance markets, as well as others. And as you can see here, the physical risks of, of weather and, and gradual changes or increases in temperature, they're going to disrupt businesses because uh, people are going to be uh, less productive, their health is going to suffer, it's going to disrupt commodity prices for agriculture, for example. We're going to see lower yields from crops. We're going to see failure of crops. And we're going to see, you know, displacement of people, uh, migration due to problems with access to water, food. And that's likely going to cause also civil, civil war or even larger conflict as people fight over diminishing resources. These are all eventually going to be reflected in asset prices leading to lower asset prices. This is a very, very similar picture, but this time it's looking at transition risks. And here, transition risks are referring to like policy changes to technology and, and changing preferences of consumers. One thing you may have heard about is called stranded assets. And this is the idea that oil and gas in the ground may not actually, it may not be economic in the future to extract it and to burn it because of declining demand as well as uh, increased cost. There's been a write-down on some of these oil reserves, 
And this is known as the stranded assets problem, where we see some assets actually being written down. Another way we see the loss of value is investments made in, in certain types of businesses or property, plant, and equipment by different companies, where those investments have to be written off or written down. So again, there's going to be a, a, a flow through to the different types of assets that are held by pension funds and ultimately potential losses, which could be small or large, depending on what the scenario is. The NGFS, again, this group of central banks and supervisors, they, they like to look at this two by two grid, where on the bottom axis, it's physical risks, and on the, the vertical axis, it's transition risks. And what they've done is they've kind of created four different combinations. The best case, an orderly transition. The next best is perhaps a disorderly transition where we delay and don't do anything, but then we have to catch up and we, we take actions, take policy actions later. In both cases, the physical risks of global warming are going to be reduced. The problem is when you get to the far right, you could have a, a world where we do too little too late, and we don't uh, do enough. And as a result, we do get there in a disorderly fashion, but we also suffer a lot of physical damage or physical risks from climate change. They have updated this this month. They've come out with a new set of scenarios. And I, I'm just going to highlight that they've got six different scenarios that they look, they're looking at, identified by those great circles. And I'm going to talk about what is meant by those different scenarios in a moment. You may be asking yourself, okay, it's very complex. This is uh, a very difficult problem for anyone to solve, not only scientists, but also uh, investors or, or citizens like ourselves. How do we go about thinking about this? How do we actually make a decision in the face of so much uncertainty? The tool that people use is called scenario analysis. Scenario analysis is simply looking at potential futures and, and what they might mean. And many people confuse a scenario with a forecast. A forecast is looking at the past, looking at relationships or trends in the past and assuming that they continue. That assumes that the past is a good predictor of the future. And that is not going to be the case, global warming and climate change. So instead, we're relying on what's called a projection. And a projection is basically a hypothetical future where you try and construct a story or a narrative based on different potential futures. And in this case, we're going to build them around different levels of greenhouse gas emissions and different levels of temperature increase out to 2050. The starting point for these scenarios is typically the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has done has created what are called global, global warming pathways. And these pathways show temperature rises of below two degrees, two degrees, three degrees, four, and higher. These are created from climate models and when you take those climate models and you combine them with an economic model, you can get an idea of how this might affect the, the overall economy. And those models that combine climate with the economy are called integrated assessment models. Those integrated assessment models are able to look at your typical you know, economic variables, such as GDP, interest rates, inflation. But they're also able to look down at a sectoral level at uh, demand and supply for different energy sources, whether it's oil, natural gas, coal, wind, solar, and hydrogen. And they see how they're going to change under different scenarios. Okay? And they can also link these changes to different sectors. So what's going to happen to healthcare? What's going to happen to the auto sector? What's going to happen to minerals and mining? What's going to happen to the utility sector? and to different asset classes, equities, bonds, infrastructure, real estate. And we're able to use that data from each individual scenario to project what we think could happen to the valuation of the holdings of an investor like a, a large asset owner like a pension fund. What is not clear is how much of these future scenarios is actually incorporated in prices today. Is there going to be a, a tipping point or a moment where markets are going to realize that this is happening and they're going to drop the prices of stocks? Or have they already been doing this slowly over time, uh, a kind of a slow burn? I just wanted to show you an example of what um, a, these pathways look like coming from the IPCC. So this is global temperature rise uh, relative to the 1850 to 1900 period. And the man-made contribution to global temperature increase is called anthropogenic warming. 
And you can see that we're up at around one degree, but with a certain uncertainty shown by that kind of orange band. Okay. And what we see is we see these at least three pathways, but with a, a considerable amount of uncertainty where the, or the average temperature of each, each pathway is either higher or lower. This is what is coming out of these climate models okay, and is fed into these economic models. What do people do with this? Well, the International Energy Agency, which um, is has been producing sort of forecasts of demand for oil, natural gas, and other energy sources for back since the 1990s, they have a model that they will feed these pathways through, and they've been creating scenarios. One of the scenarios, stated policies or steps, reflects what's actually been announced and the targets. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, they, they put out a scenario last year a slower recovery than in the steps, but uh, with the sim similar assumptions. They put out a scenario they call the sustainable development scenario, where there is a surge in investment in clean energy that puts us on track to achieve the Paris Agreement. And they've also done a scenario out to what would it take to actually get to net zero global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We are basically not adding to the stock of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. We're actually extracting as much as actually being produced through both natural means, but also through human means. Here you can see they're showing what would happen in terms of the amount of greenhouse gases in tons of CO2 would be produced under different scenarios. And you can see that the sustainable recovery scenario is the one where we're actually taking action to reduce greenhouse gases. That's the green scenario at the bottom. You can see that the stated policies or steps is the blue line. And, uh, you know, we're not really seeing, based on stated policies, any change in how much greenhouse gases are being emitted every year. Based on these scenarios, they then tell you, okay, well, this is what the, the demand and the prices have been for oil, natural gas, and coal, and this is what is likely to be happening. Here, this is under the net zero 2050 scenario, so the one where we actually reduce greenhouse gases to zero. And as you can see, there's a, a, a very dramatic drop in oil. Uh, and coal, as well as natural gas. And you may be asking yourself, well, what is going to replace those energy sources? What they do is they, their scenario is based on us moving almost 80 to 90 percent towards renewable energy sources for generating electricity. And by renewable, I mean wind, which is the blue line, it's solar, the other sharply rising orange line, uh, but also hydropower and um, other renewable sources. We're going to see just a whole conversion of our energy uh, supply from the traditional fossil fuels to these more uh, greenhouse gas friendly sources of renewable energy. One of the things that BCI is looking at is not only the, the damages that could happen because of transition risk or uh, physical risk, but also where are the opportunities? Because clearly there's going to be uh, winners and losers in the economy from this. We know that the fossil fuel sector is going to do badly, but the, the market for renewables is obviously going to be uh, do very well and require a great amount of investment. Electric vehicle sales, uh, by under their scenario, basically we're not going to be using internal combustion engines anymore. We're going to be basically seeing uh, an 18-time increase in the number of electric car sales by 2030. At the same time, demand for energy per person is going to actually decline as we become more efficient. Okay, so we retrofit buildings, we use electric vehicles, we change our behaviors. That is actually going to lead to lower demand, even though GDP goes up and the population goes up as well globally. There are going to be uh, actually jobs created. And in their, in their scenario, the net zero scenario, they see 14 million new jobs created by 2030. However, there's going to be a loss of jobs in certain sectors. So there's going to be people losing jobs in coal, oil and gas. There's going to be a huge uh, increase in jobs in electricity and renewables and other sectors. And some of those people are going to be able to move, but there's also going to be a, a displacement. Some people will not be able to be retrained. They have to be supported through the transition. And that's obviously going to be something that has to be uh, a part of our, our fiscal policy. And there has to be a lot of investment to train people for these new kind of jobs. So what do we do? Well, we're doing both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. 
Uh, the top down is trying to understand what this means from a pension fund or a large asset owners for the whole portfolio. Where are they exposed to risk in their portfolio? And they look across asset classes and across regions. And eventually there's going to be a bottom up. Although our project is not looking at this, obviously there are people who are looking at, well, which industries are going to do better? Uh, which companies within each sectors are going to be leaders and laggards? Which ones are adapting and and pledging to meet net zero and taking actions and which are only greenwashing. Okay. What we do in, in our work is we basically try and feed the outputs of these of these different scenarios into models uh, that can be used to value what will happen to, in particular, um, equities of, of publicly listed companies at this time, but also later privately issued um, equity and, and other asset classes. Higher expenses due to uh, carbon taxes a price on carbon, which is going to be paid by companies, higher investment in new capital expenditures, which is going to be a draw on cash flow, but could generate higher profits in the future, even if they're negative in the short run. An increase in, in uh, uncertainty, which will increase um, interest rates, or what's called the discount rate for valuing future cash flows, which will make uh, a higher discount rate makes any future cash flows worth less today, which means the profits from companies are going to be valued less today and their stock prices are going to be lower. Thank you very much for your attention. If you'd like to find more, please visit our website at PICS or email me at michaelking at uvic.ca.